Happy Friday, beer me. Let's go. It's Friday morning beers for no reason because we don't have Sam Munson on. That's okay. I don't have a Halloween costume yet. So as I drink this pumpkin, Elysian Night Owl, is this good? Tweet me at Up and Adam Show and also give me costume ideas. We've got a TNF breakdown with Brandon Marshall on the show. Love having him and college wide receiver turned corner sensation. Reek the Freak, Tariq Woolen is on the show. <laughs> the Ravens making everything spooky for Tom Brady. The Ravens beat the Buccaneers 27-22. Uh, and on the show earlier this week, Monday, I was wondering whether or not the Ravens' win over the Browns would be enough to, speaking of Halloween, exercise the demons of these crazy fourth quarter collapses. Eric Weddle, a weekly guest on our show, says... Don't worry about those collapses. They're going to figure it out. And they did. And last night proved that it's not going to be an issue, hopefully. Uh, odd first half, Baltimore ran the ball seven times. I'm like banging my head against my wall like, what's happening? That was the fewest in the first half in the entire Lamar Jackson era. But the Ravens absolutely, I don't even know what the word, bludgeoned comes to mind. They bludgeoned the Bucks after halftime. You're seeing it right here. Uh, Lamar and company rushed for 202 yards on nearly eight yards per carry in the second half alone to put the game away. The Ravens have now won consecutive games. Mm -mm -mm. It's not very good for, that, for these guys. It's not good for these guys over here. But they went back to backs for the first time all year and they move a half game up on those guys for the AFC North lead. The point is, the only takeaway you need to know is the fourth quarter thing hopefully is done. And they looked like the Ravens, the one that we've been waiting for and you need to watch out. And on the Buck side, early, I was happy. It looked like they solved some of their issues offensively. They racked up 10 points on a couple of impressive first quarter drives. But it boils down to this. They didn't find the end zone again until garbage time. And it was painful to watch after taking what the defense was giving them early. And if you watched and heard our show yesterday, that's all we talked about. That's what Brady does. Take what the defense gives you. And they did it to start the game. Somehow it spiraled and it fell apart. And they fell back into these bad habits we've seen all season. They became super one-dimensional. They were predictable. It wasn't fun to look at. And this Bucks offense... I'm just, they are completely broken. I'm not hot takey, I know it's weak, whatever. I'm starting to wonder whether or not a fix can happen, what they can do to amend it and make it work, because it just fell apart last night. Brady's really upset, he's at his locker, we're here, and I haven't been on Twitter, but I'm hearing, is, the, is it like a legit source? The divorce paperwork is in between he and Giselle, of course, and that matters because it's going to be highly publicized, it's going to be asked about Tom Brady, you're saying Brady announced it? Yeah. Brady announced it, so, you know, he's getting ahead of it. He's going to, you know, like, you have to understand, like, this is a guy who's going to have to deal with PR meetings and that and all of, you know, we don't know how that's all going on behind closed doors. So it, it's a, I imagine, a lot. It's not the reason this is happening, of course, but it's all kind of happening at the same time, and, and things sort of fell apart here. Um, and then you got to look at just the craziness that reverberates around the league here. By the way, <laughs> the winner of the Falcons-Panthers this weekend will officially move into first place in the NFC South. And with that, I think we need to pop a beer open because that's just like a cheers moment for, for those two squads. I thank you, my bartender, who's going to be Tinkerbell for, uh, for Halloween somewhere this weekend. This is like a keychain one. Oh, boy. Uh, and also, let's bring in my good friend and six-time Pro Bowler, founder of the I Am Athlete Media Empire, 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 mm -hmm. Empire, mm -hmm. Brandon Marshall. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's go, let's go. You like I'm in my little, uh, this empire, we need to get better. Look at our office space. Yeah. You know, this little, you know, it's, we got to clean it up a little bit. Tell me, it kind of matches our set, which I like. You match the colors of the show, <laughs> which I appreciate. Uh, but I feel like every time I talk to you, it's where in the world is Brandon Marshall? Like, where in the world are you? Yes. It's uh, 2006. I was drafted to this team. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know. You're in Denver right now? Why are you in Denver right now? Yeah, I'm in Denver. I'm Why? in Denver. So I'm out here at the Colorado University's uh, Depression uh, Center, and I'm oh, speaking... Wow with a small group on, you know, just mental health and where we're at in the community. So this is where it all started. And a lot of people don't know that the, this Denver community, uh, there's a lot of trailblazers, a lot of leaders when it comes to mental health. 
Um, a lot to talk about. You know, as we know, over the last couple of years, we've had a lot of pro athletes stand up uh, and speak out, right? Like even I heard you talking about Tom Brady and divorce papers being in. You watched that game last night mm -hmm. and you watch him in his press conference and, you know, his body language and you try to compare it to years before. I'm not saying that uh, he's dealing with any type of mental health diagnosis or anything like that, but that's a lot of stress. Whether we want to say it or not, that's a lot of stress that you carry when the, the thing that's the, the closest to you, your wife, your family, is breaking down. Uh, so when you watch these games, right, just imagine the rest of the guys, 58 guys, right, guys active, and then the practice squad guys on that sideline, what they're dealing with, right? So, yeah, the, the Tampa Bay Bucks, they stink right now. And, there's you know, they should be better, you know, with the guys they – have in that locker room, the coaching staff that they have, they should be better. But when you have players, you know, really struggling, maybe off the field, now we're starting to see how it could potentially affect on it. It's very true. And, you know, we, you know, we heard about him being in the locker room after the game last night. You know, Tom Brady doesn't take any loss. We had Jordan Spieth on yesterday, but, you know, huge star golfer saying that he went golfing with Brady once and Brady, uh, he, he had a good hit or a shot or whatever. And, uh, and Brady wouldn't talk to him for an hour. We know what a competitor he is. And that's part of that, the weight of that, the pressure of that that he's dealing with. And, you know, we'll see how this resolves itself. I My question is, is it fixable? I'm looking at them as a team, given what you're saying off the field, on the field. Field. They've lost three straight. They've lost five of their last six. Is this thing fixable? Because I'm starting to say no. Yeah, I think it it all comes down to Tom Brady, right? And 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 I'm saying that understanding as a ex NFL guy that there's so many other factors. It doesn't come down to one guy, right? But in this situation, okay, Tom Brady, we know who he is. Physically, he can still do it. Mentally, he obviously is head of everyone else. He knows what the defense is going to do before they before they do it. He's been studying and, and playing against these defenses and these defensive coordinators longer than some of these players that are playing inside these schemes. So if Tom Brady can turn it back around and lead the way, right, that Tom Brady, when they won it in 2020, that text everybody on the team said, this is on me and we're going to turn it around, and then you see them run it off, right? Um because they have people on the other side, right? They have pass rushers. Just imagine if they're playing with a lead, you know, and you got the running game, Leonard Fournette back on track, and you have Mike Evans and Julio Jones healthy, and all of those guys healthy and playing their role. This is a team that's more than capable because a lot of times uh, it's more mental than physical, right? And that's why it's, it's a weird year when you look at the Tom Brady's of the world, like, how are you struggling here? And yeah. then you look at the Russell Wilsons, like, you've been in the league for 10 years. How are you guys struggling here? And then you can go on Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan benched. You yeah. know, we're talking about we're talking about uh, the most experienced quarterbacks in the NFL struggling this year. And then you see uh, uh, the opposite end of the spectrum, these younger quarterbacks coming in and playing at a high level. Right. Like things are changing in the National Football League. But, Kay, to answer your question, I do believe that with the right type of mindset, this team can turn around because I played for Todd Bowles and it starts there. He's a great head coach. And then you have Tom Brady, the GOAT, who can still do it physically. OK, but where's his mind? Where's his mindset? And then the guys around him. I truly believe in those guys. I do, too. But what do you see? You know, you p competed against him in the AFC East for all those years. You know him. You've watched all of his games, his championships, all of that. When I look out there, I feel like he's forcing things. He's not playing the defense as it comes to him, which is something that's uncharacteristic of Brady. Is When you are watching Brady, like, what is the problem? Like, is he pressing out there? Yeah. Well, I see a guy uh, or a team that uh, they're not aligned. I don't see any chemistry and continuity in this, almost as if we're going back to 2020, right? Remember 2020, those first couple of games, hell, was pretty much the first nine games. Yes. They struggled. You know, is it Bruce Arians' offense? Is it Tom Brady's offense? They had no identity. So to me, when I look at this offense, that's what I see. Guys not in position, guys not being where they're supposed to be. When they get a, a, a few big plays, get those type of opportunities, they're not taking advantage of it. Uh, but these are all fixable things, though, Kay. When you walk into a locker room after a game like that last night, you look at the film and you say, you know, are we just trash or are we can we fix these things, right? Like pre-snap penalties, you know, that type of stuff, protecting the quarterback, right? Like you can fix some of those things, right? Um, it's all about a want to. 
you know, and, and there's some things that we don't know that's happening in that locker room. And, 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 and as we sit up here and we speak about, you know, these athletes and these teams, we always got to think about that. There's some things we don't know. Probably 70 percent of the things that happen in the locker room never get out. So mm. there's some things we can't even talk about. What if there's beef in the locker room? What if, you know, there's beef in, 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 within the uh, coaching staff? You saw Coach Todd Bowles come out today and say everything is on the table, including coaching changes, mm-hmm. right? Like, this is, it, it feels like it's too early to be having these type of conversations. But it's, but so it tells too, me that it might it, be more. No, but it's too late to be fixing chemistry. So you tell me, how do you, you know, we're talking about this now for five minutes, and I don't hear any sort of solution. We need to change their mindset. It's up to Tom Brady. Like, they, Tom Brady, you, I don't know what the rest of the locker room, Tom Brady, I know, wants to win. He might be overwhelmed. He right. might be going through stuff, but he wants to. How do you fix chemistry halfway through the season? You know, as a competitor and as an athlete, when, you know, we're up here talking about it, I'm sure these guys are watching this show, right? Some of these guys will see mm. these these clips. You guys do a phenomenal do- job on social media. Taylor! Right? They're watching. There you go, good job, Taylor. They're watching. She She's killing Twitter, by the she's way. She's the Golly. best, yeah. Right? Woo, um, Taylor! You know, <laughs> yeah, show love to the team! But, uh, you know, you, they're watching the first takes of the world, and they're seeing guys report. And as a competitor, you don't like that. You know, I don't care where you're at in your career. You don't like people talking negative about yourself, your play, and your team. So I think that is one of those things where we got to see how they respond over the next, you know, a uh, few days. You know, when you think about Coach Bowles, Coach Bowles said something a couple weeks ago. He said, you know, he, he basically said something like, we can't hang our hats off of the Super Bowl year. All right? Like, really pay attention to these coaches, what they're mm-hmm. speaking. I'm telling you, I sat – They'll tell you what's going on in the locker room now. I've sat in those seats, right, where a coach comes out and he might he may say something. It might be a little thing, or 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 a captain or one of the leaders on the team. They might say something, and it's nothing that we're talking about or discussing on television, right? He may be telling us that, man. Maybe these guys, when they walk into practice, walk into film, they may not be they may not be busting their butts like they used to in 2020, right? So when the coach come out and say things like that, like, "Oh, we can't hang our hats off of the Super Bowl year. We can't we can't think that this is going to carry us." That may be telling me that that's telling me that these guys may be taking some things for granted. Yeah, and I think that played into a little bit of Tom Brady's frustrations when he mulled retirement and he went back. That was sort of the rumors, you know, I don't know, I wasn't in the locker room, but that, you know, he won a Super Bowl. He, he's, you know, he went back to back Super Bowls and the next year was just as hungry for that next one. But, uh, you know, I think that there was a feeling that maybe the rest of the locker room wasn't going to come back and operate at the level and the mentality that he and Belichick shared. And I think right. that maybe Tom Brady you know, realize, man, like I should, you know, not everybody thinks like me. Bill Belichick thinks like me. And that's, I do think why that was the perfect marriage because it was, who cares? We could win 10, we could win 11. We always want the next one. Now, Bowles is kind of quiet and he was criticized for that. You know, I lived in New York for a long time uh, and he got it from the back pages a lot for that and criticized by the media, but his players loved him and loved talking about him, went to bat for him. What is it about Bowles, you think, that he can sort of help? What is it about Bowles that can help bring this thing together and turn it around? Just that. Right. Whether uh, we're winning or we're losing, his hand stays steady. Mm-hmm. Right. I can I say hate. I hate it when in, on teams when things are going extremely well or extremely bad. Everybody start freaking out. Right. You start seeing the owner start coming to practice. Like, what the hell are you doing down here? You ain't been down here. In seven weeks, eight weeks, now you want to come watch practice, get your butt back in your office. The general managers, what, go scout the players. What are you doing? Now you want yeah. to be in practice? Now you want, you're want you coming in our meeting rooms now? Okay. Hey, coaches start changing things. You heard the, the Miami Dolphins. Remember, the Miami Dolphins early in the season, they're taking out ping pong tables. That's what happens in losing situations. And it just starts deteriorating your, your, your whole identity, your whole team from the inside, right? Coach Bowles is not that type of guy. And and that's the type of guy that real competitors and real players like to play for. It's like, look, we are grown men. We know we're getting our butts kicked. We turn on the film. We know what we're supposed to do. Our alignment, our assignments, we understand that. Just get your job done. He's one of those guys. So when you ask me the question, you know, 
why Coach Bowles in this situation, how he can get it right, it's because of that, his leadership. You want a leader, no matter what the situation is, they're cool, calm, and collected. They're not going to come in and change things. We ain't practiced this. Now, all of a sudden, I remember playing for the uh, Denver Broncos. I ain't going to name who I was playing for at the time, but I was playing for the Denver Broncos. And we changed our defense three or four times, K. We went from a 4-3 to a 3-4 to a 4-6. And some other defense, I had no clue. It was like a 1-3-7 or some shit. I don't even know. So excuse my language. It's fine. <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> we drink a beer on tea. But we changed our defense so many times. And we start freaking out internally because we're like, we have no chance. We don't even know who we are. And I'm gonna be fine for saying the S H I T word. Listen, I think you're. I mm. think I think you're fine. I think you're warranted. You're. You're. We, I don't know if you made me feel better about them. That's all. I'm, I'm sitting here. We're we're 15 minutes in, and we have to go to break. And we'll, we'll bring you back, of course. But I'm like, man, uh, you know, the Shanahan. What are you thing drinking? What are you drinking? What <laughs> are you drinking? I didn't I say Shanahan. I didn't say Shanahan. <laughs> I did not say Shanahan. It rhymes with Ike Schlamahan. We'll be back with Brendan Marshall after this. <laughs> Keeping it real as always. Back on Up and Adams with Brandon Marshall, our fave. Oh, but what an outfit here. Ryan Fitzpatrick hanging out with a massive Harry Potter fan. Mike Evans, he can do what he wants. Uh, what's your take on the outfit, the tiger stripes from Fitzy? <laughs> Sick. Fitz, uh, he doesn't care. You know what? He actually does care. Like, I played with Fitz. I think the world knows that. Love him. He was the best quarterback I played for. Um, don't at me. Um, and, and, and Fitz, he's one of those guys like Fitz, well, why don't you try it like this or try it like that? And he's like, nah, I don't like all of that stuff. I think what he loves is us talking about mm. how terrible his outfits look and that's his brand. So yeah. hats off to Fitzy for staying on brand. He's your favorite quarterback you ever played for. You said that when you were here in studio, who's the best quarterback you ever played with the best on the field? I would say the, the, the quarterback that, um, had the best. Talent? Uh, uh, talent, I would say, is Jay Cutler. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I, we, have, we always have to bring up Jay Cutler in every interview that we do together. He was so t That arm was insane. I know. And listen, not only that, but his, his, his IQ on the field, because there's football. You can have extreme high football IQ and have brains you know, rocks for brains as, you know, off the field, yeah. right? So both, he he was through the roof on both. This guy, a lot of things that I do to this day is because of Jay, like coming into the cafeteria, seeing what books he was reading. He was ahead of his time, whether it was on parenting, whether it was on nutrition. So a lot of the things that wow. I'm doing today uh, and how I've developed into the man I am is because of Jay Cutler. So, you know, he definitely uh, had the ability there. I would say he was a bit of an underachiever. Um, but it wasn't all on him. It wasn't all on him. I just love when you talk about it. I want you and Jay to just, he has Jay. to come on I Am Athlete. He, he, why, is he, why is he not coming on? We, we're, we're working on something. We're working on something. Jay's God. just like a little funky sometimes. I'll go through my stories. I'm posting every day. And guess yeah. who I say? Guess who I see? If Jay Cutler had right. uh, Instagram. And I'm like, Jay, you're, you're watching me. I see you. Yeah. Slide in the DMs, baby. He's not Slide watching me. No, I slid in, I I slid in the DMs. I said You tried to get him on the I show. I did. I thought he'd be great because I I really wanted him. Remember when Fox gave him that deal in the booth? Yes. I was yes. and then the Dolphins, the idiot Dolphins were like, "Here's 10 million, come back for the year." And he didn't do it. I was I was living for having Jake Cutler in the booth because you can say what you want. He'd be honest. He'd be refreshing. It'd be he's in, really intelligent. Like we'd get something out of him. So I I did I you know I'll just I slipped in Jake Cutler's DMs and I said I think I even said like, "Hey, I'll do a whiskey tasting with you. Like you tell me what to go buy, we'll do it." <laughs> like I was like thirsting after him to come on the show, and now I'm over it. <laughs> Unsend. I don't think he, I don't think he ever even looked at it. That's so why I'm like, oh yeah, wow. Mean, okay, wait. We have, to, we have don't to talk about up. this. We're, talk, we're talking IMF quarterbacks. You, get him on your show. Well, you tell him when you're on, then he needs to come on my show. We just want to have fun here. Uh, I want you to listen to this Aaron Rodgers sot. That's what we call it in the business. Take a look. Sot. Like you guys are close, and it's just one player here or there. It's definitely not just one player here or there. Like I said, it's you know 20 percent of the time. If, if we have 50 plays and we have 10 mental uh, missed assignments or mental errors, that's 20% of the time. So that's way too high. You know, in the past, we're looking more like at, uh, you know, less than 10%. So it gives us, you know, a really good chance to be successful. 20%, that's too high. You know, that's, you know, that's a, you know one play a series where you're really making it tough on yourself. So we got to fix that. 
And whatever that is, I think, you know, guys who are making too many mistakes shouldn't be playing. You know, we gotta got to start cutting some reps. Are we cool with him handling this like this publicly? Uh, what is it? What did he do? What was it called? Asawanda? What was the thing that he took? A uh, little ayahuasca. ritual? Ayahuasca. That's what I have I every know. morning. Listen, I don't... <laughs> I don't know if I like this uh, post ayahuasca Aaron Rodgers or not, right? Like, listen, sometimes when you go through these therapeutic things, you become a phenomenal person. But as an athlete, it tears you up. Like, you really don't have it. Like, no, I don't want to hear this from Aaron Rodgers because I played against Aaron Rodgers. You know this, Kate. Yeah. You sat in some of these games and these seats watching him take on the Chicago Bears and absolutely own the Chicago Bears and everybody else in the NFL. And, and, I, and I say that because it was never perfect. That was a special thing about that Green Bay Packers playing against them. It was like, even when, 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 they, were, when they were right, obviously they lit it up. When they were wrong, it, it almost seemed as if they were a better team. Mm. I'm telling you, like the plays that they made, that you know him getting pushed out of the pocket and scrambling, and then you see, you know, all of the other wide receivers getting into scramble mode and him making a play. So I just don't want to hear that. The thing that I uh, 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 care the most about is like the wide receivers dropping balls, those type of things. But okay. all the other stuff, I don't want to hear about. Um, Aaron Rodgers. It just seems like he's in this therapeutic state right now. And I, I've been there before where it's like, you know, as a as a as a non football player, you're thriving. But when you get on the field, you got to tap into like this, like this weird type of behavior, this weird type of mindset. And sometimes it just doesn't translate. I mean, he does have 11 touchdowns, just three interceptions. Those wide receivers are dropping the ball. I think, you know, I think everyone there are a lot of people want the quarterback to come out and say it's on, it's on me. It's all on me. It's all on me. And it, the truth mm. is that it's not all on him. So do, I, don't, like, I don't know what to think about that. Do I have a problem with him telling the truth? Not really. I actually like that he tells the truth. I find it kind of refreshing uh, that he's like that. Do you think they have any shot of pulling off a win Sunday night at Buffalo? Uh, yeah, for sure. You know, absolutely. You know, 1%, 2%. <laughs> <laughs> no, really? This is going to be, this is going to be horrible. Right. I mean, it's going to take like, you know, someone's going to have to take, you know, Josh Allen's bus, you know, on the way to the stadium. I know it's a home game. Right. It's a home game. It's in, it's in Buffalo. So like however they travel to the stadium, they just need to take and capture his his bus, his car, whatever, and just hold him ca uh, captive for three or four oh hours. And that's that's the opportunity that they have. Uh, Josh Allen just has to be a no show. Uh, let's go to New York, where you like to, they love you in New York. Anything you say just goes in New York. It's amazing. <laughs> and both teams are hot right now. Listen, I'm trying to book, I'm going to New York next week. And I'm trying to yeah. book guests. I'm like, can I get some Giants and Jets, two teams that I love and I've always like, spoke well about. And they're so yeah. shut down. You know, like when a team's doing really well. So yeah. I'll do this. Coach Dayball, I'll call, I'll text, I'll put you <laughs> in a group text with Coach Dayball. Um, Thank you. And then also the the hit PR, like they were mad at me. Uh, Jets, they actually, after Zach Wilson's uh, presser last I week. I know they were This bad. week, yesterday. <laughs> I know. No, so listen, I came out and I said, I didn't like how he handled that. So yes. I get all these calls because yes. I have a great relationship with the Jets. Yes. So I get all these calls and like Brandon will explain to me how. And then after uh, his presser yesterday, he's like, did he do good on this one? I was like, hell yeah. Great. Are you in New York next <laughs> so, week? So, no, I'm going to do it. Uh, Monday, Tuesday. No, no. No, I'm in Cabo. I'm in Cabo. Oh, well. So I'm not even going to be so on your show different. next week. So, Richard, well, uh, our producer, don't book me next week because I'm in Cabo. <laughs> okay, I'd like, I'd like a live shot from Cabo, <laughs> but we won't have you. I have one more quick one for you. Let's talk about the Giants. They're 6-1. and one. No, seriously. No, seriously. I'm going to put you in a group text yeah, with Coach Dayball. Okay, I, think, I got you. Yeah, I think I've, I don't know if it was from your – I've definitely communicated with Dayball, not on my phone, but on someone else's just because I'm, I'm a huge fan, of course. And But they're being real – you know, they're – they're protecting their six and one situation right. and which I understand, but they have a big one this weekend. It's again, it's another team that has stunned a lot of people this year, the Seattle Seahawks. So you were with Gino on both the jets and the giants early on in his career. What are you feeling about Gino and does he have what it takes to keep it going? Yeah, I, I think it's just like this. I don't know how to explain it. Kay. It's um, Gino. One of the reasons why Gino struggled when he was young is because for me personally, you know, I lived with him. I was his roommate when I first got to New York a whole six months. He was just, uh, uh, he was immature 
and extremely cocky in a mm. sense, right? So now I feel like he's mature and is still a little bit cocky, right? Like, you know, after his first game, I didn't like what he said. He was like, well, they wrote me off, but I didn't write back, right? <laughs> That's Geno Smith. When you're balling and you are actually mature, you're coming on time, you're studying uh, early, you're studying late, you can be whoever you want to be, okay? So I feel like he it's just like he's in this perfect season where – him, the football player, him, the person, is the perfect pet match. And he's mature. He's doing really well now. Tenth season in the league, veteran. He understands the game. 73.5% of his passes uh, he's completing. He leads the NFL. So good luck to him, unfortunately, against those Giants. Uh, and then it'll be a good one with the Patriots going up against those Jets in New York. We won't see you from Cabo, but hopefully we talk soon. If you end up being in New York, because I always feel like you're in New York. I always feel like you're there. I'm always so, in New York. Uh, Every we will Monday, talk Tuesday. To you. Good luck in Denver. You're doing important work out there uh, for mental health and awareness, and you're just the best. I almost swore Thanks, because I had like three sips of beer. I mean, you're the <laughs> best. You're the best. Brandon Marshall, hey. uh, we'll talk to you <laughs> later. we got to get him back in the studio. Don't you guys think at the Super Bowl, me and Brandon Marshall for like a, a whole situation would be ideal and great? Oh, my gosh. I would just love his cell phone. I would love it. We've got Tariq Woolen on the show after this. Talk about an incredible story. Fifth round draft pick, all smiles, tied for the league leading interceptions. Tariq Woolen is a rising star. He has four interceptions through only seven games with the Seahawks. This is his rookie year. He started out his football life as a wide receiver, and he's now a lockdown corner in Seattle, one with big dreams and big ideas of who he wants to go one-on-one -on -one with. Take a listen. Hi, Tariq. Listen, I think everyone in the NFL world is kind of stunned. I mean, we all feel like we got got because it's a bit wild that your team is sitting atop the NFC West above three teams that all went to the playoffs that everybody was chirping about all offseason. So have you surprised yourselves with this early start? Uh, Not really. You know, we knew we had the type of talent, the type of team to be a winning team. And sometimes people may not see that at the beginning. And that's just the beginning. And, and this league is about how you finish. So one game at a time and she just keep winning, really. You're 6'4", you ran a 426 at the Combine, and you're already one of the best athletes, of course, in the entire NFL. How in the world did you fall to the fifth round? Uh, shoot. Uh, that, that's a, a great question. Honestly, I don't know. Uh, I heard a lot of stuff about just my experience playing the game or just even people thinking I may not understand the playbook as much just because I had just started playing the position. So, um, you know, I don't knock him for that, but at first, I just thought I was going pretty early. To be honest, I heard so much hype, but now I'm just happy I'm here. Uh, everyone describes your personality as laid back and goofy. And then there's this quote from you. I always smile because I don't think there's a reason not to. Mm -hmm. What's been your biggest smile so far this season? If you had to pick one moment, take me there. Uh, my first interception. Tell, uh, to take uh, me I, through that. Uh, honestly, shoot, I just was in his own coverage. And I was reading the quarterback and the receiver, I put rhythm in my vision. And I knew that I had a chance to jump the ball. So as soon as I seen him release, it was just a, a good chance for me to jump the route. And I did, and I had made a play. But it was just a, a cool feeling because one, it's my first interception in the league. And then two, uh, in college, I never really caught too many interceptions, especially uh, my first one I had in college, I had a cast on. So it felt good to actually have both hands. Wow. Well, you're, yeah, but you're saying you didn't catch too many interceptions. Tariq, you only caught two. You caught two your entire college career. You have four already this rookie season. Now, you started at UT San Antonio. You were a wide receiver. Mm -hmm. I did my homework. So what have you learned about yourself early in your NFL career already? Uh, shoot, just keep working, honestly. And it, it's pretty, like, an unpredictable league, but uh, you just got to keep working every day. And I just been noticing just as long as I just keep locking in on certain stuff and get to knowing myself even more, it makes the job a lot easier. It's a takeaway, Tariq Wollin. Yeah, and now and then you have Richard Sherman helping coach mm -hmm. you up apparently. So these days you hear Tariq Wollin, you also hear Richard Sherman in the same yeah. sentence. How has he helped you before the season? What's your relationship like? He just gave me advice on making the plays and even if it's a big play or a small play or a bad play, just go to the next play because anything can happen. So uh, 
just whenever he reaches out to me and stuff, I just make sure I gain as much knowledge as I can. It's really smart. Now, being constantly compared to him is great. It's a big compliment. But at a certain point, I'm like, okay, everybody, that's cool. But Tariq's him. Like, he can, he kind of stands alone. How do you feel about it? Oh, uh, shoot. Uh, it's cool because Richard Sherman, a, a great cornerback. So I just look at his highlights all the time. And uh, I just want to make a legacy for myself, really. I, like, just how people always say, oh, like Richard, like Richard. Well, one day I want somebody to be like, oh, like Tariq, you know what I'm saying? Or like Rico, you know, Avatar or whatever. So yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, that, that is a pretty cool thing to be mentioned with him, though. Tell, tell me this. Is it av the Avatar? Is it Reek the Freak? What What are we trying to get people to call you in the big leagues here? Uh, I mean, the Avatar thing started here, but to everybody else know me as Reek, Reek the Freak, or just Reek. <laughs> what else do we need to know about you? You know, you're, big, you're doing a big introduction to NFL fans. Uh, we know you're goofy. We know you have a light side. We know you can't swim via your Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I know you like Future, which I I think that's a little shade of Russell Wilson. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I like I like Future a lot. I like Future. I've been listening to Future for the longest. So, uh, I mean, I really don't discriminate when it comes to music anyway. I listen to everything that sounds good. Um, I do like to listen to country, and I don't think many people know that, but I do like to listen to country. I like to listen to, you know, a little alternative, but mostly hip hop. What kind of country? What do you listen uh, to? My favorite song is Dirt Road Anthem by Jason Aldean. Wow. I like that song. Yes, ma'am. That's like, an older uh, song there. Oh, yeah. Oh, Avatar? Yeah, no, that's a classic. <laughs> that's amazing. I love that. That's a good little bit, bit to, to know about. You know, you lined up against some ridiculous competition already. You got Cortland Sutton, Debo Samuel. I don't know how anybody stops him or contains him at all. Hollywood Brown, Mike Williams. Who do, you, who do you want? You close your eyes, you ask for a wish, and you get to take this guy on one-on-one. -on -one. Who do you want? Uh, shoot, a guy I always wanted to face was D-Hop. I mean, D-Hop is a, a great receiver. And when I was a receiver, that's one of the guys to look at. It's because, like, when the ball around him, especially deep ball, he's going to catch it. So the first go round, I didn't get to play against him, but we do play against him next week. And that would be a cool matchup. Him and Julio Jones. I like Julio a lot. Tariq, are you crazy? I would pick the practice squad slot receiver who's 37 years old. Like, you want that smoke from those guys. Oh, yeah, I mean... It's, it's not it's not necessarily smoke, but it's just uh, when you come into the league, you always have players you want to go against or you looked up to. And when I was a receiver, I never seen myself in this position. I always when I was a receiver, I was I wanted to be like a Julio or something. So just now I'm in this position, I get to go against those guys on this level. Shoot, why not want to go against them because those are guys that you looked up to once before. Well, you are 6'4", so you are a receiver, and you're going to scare all those guys out there in those one-on-one -on -one yeah. matchups. We are so excited about it. Uh, it's the Giants, 6-1, and one, one of the biggest mm -hmm. games of the weekend. What's the biggest challenge uh, in an offense that's so run-heavy and features all those tight ends? So, <laughs> as a corner, you got to bring your pass this game. That's what they're going to say. You just bring your pass. I remember in college, we, we played Army, and it was like a run-heavy team. And I used to hate it because when you get bored of the run, that's when they throw something over your head or try to throw the ball. So this week, just being disciplined, not getting bored, but also understanding that I got to play a, a, you know, a role in the run game much more than I did in other weeks. You know, you, I looked at your Instagram and you said a lot about how you've always dreamed of being in the NFL or how you can't wait to get to the NFL. Like that's sort of a theme throughout your social posts. And now you're here and you're almost half a season in. Is it what you thought it would be? Like when you compare it to what you would dreamt about, like, are you feeling that? Oh yeah, um, a little bit, a little bit. I just so happen to be on a great team. Uh, I used to watch Hard Knocks and stuff on Netflix and Hulu and all that. And I just see like them cussing and, or they fighting at practice or, you know, they, they just made it like kind of like, oh, like this is the hardest thing ever. But it, at the same time, it's football and it's just a fun game, really. And then coming here it just showed me even more why football is a fun game and it's a player's game. And the uh, coaches here do a good job and just the people throughout the whole facility, you know, they feel like a family and they make sure, you know, they cool with you. Ain't nobody like a stranger, you know, everybody say hello when you're in the hallway and stuff like that. So just all those factors playing in, it make you, you know, feel comfortable here. Last one for you. Have you had your welcome to the NFL moment? Everybody says that moment sort of happens. Was it that interception or have you had it yet? Uh, shoot, I had a good and a bad one. I could say uh, the bad one is my first one I had when we played the Broncos. <laughs> I had killed a blocker, and it was just me and uh, Devontae Williams. 
and uh, he had came off the edge, and I had wrapped him up, but it was one of those moments like, oh, okay, like, <laughs> this is what an NFL <laughs> running back is like. Mm -hmm. But the, the good one was the interception, and just to keep pounding up the interceptions, because I feel like the more and more I do that, the more I turn heads. Yeah, they keep coming your way. Uh, we would, yeah. Listen, we, do you promise that when you are an all-pro, and you're this, you're like the, you know, you promise you will not forget little K Adams who was cheering you on for a year, right? No, I got you. I won't forget. Amazing. And uh, good, good luck with Deha. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Tariq. Congratulations on all the success. Good luck this weekend. Well, of course, have a good one. Bye. There is a short list of players who are so easy to root for that it doesn't matter if you're a rival in their division, if you hate their team on every other Sunday, but you have a soft spot for them. And this is a story everyone can get behind. I could not have been more appreciative, blown away by his charisma, his lightheartedness, also a chip on his shoulder for being taken in the fifth round, him handling as well as he did. And I loved his answer on taking on the Giants. And the comparisons to Army and his rookies are so genuine and they say what they feel. Uh, and so we appreciate the Seahawks, of course, for that beautiful shot and for the time with a young rookie who's got so much to look forward to in this National Football League. And yes, they are at the top of the NFC West. Who would have called it? We got to get an interception. Uh, and every time he does, hit me up at Up and Adam Show because I for sure will be on my couch rooting for him. And we've got more action coming up here on the show. We got to get your DF yes over at FanDuel. Who should get in your line? Lineups. Plus, stop bullying Russell Wilson. Time for a little DF. Yes. Yes, it's Friday. Yes, we've got Daily Fantasy Values for you because if you are submitting a lineup that covers all of week eight, I've got you covered. Uh, go over to FanDuel Sportsbook and put in some plays. And let's start with a quarterback named Tua Tunga Vaya Loa, 7,700. What? Fourth highest priced quarterback in the 1 p.m. window. But he had 261 yards in his return last week. I think he has an even better day in a dome against the Lions defense that's allowed the most points in the NFL this season. That's sort of a gimme. That's sort of a nice plug and play there. Derrick Henry, another one. Is this just how we're doing it? Just like on cam like this? Okay. Derrick Henry, $10,000. If there's a week to pay up for Derrick Henry, it's this one. The Texans have the worst run defense in the entire National Football League this season. Henry, he's cooking. He's making it happen. He's averaging 140 yards per game. Four touchdowns over the last four. Where's that gift? Oh, no, Taylor's going to gift that. I, I need clearance on the gifts that happen on this show. Or gifs, what do you call them? I'm such a grandma. I don't a gif, gif, a gif. Like there are some outrageous ones out there. Raheem Mostert, sixty-eight hundred dollars, baby. He's been on a tear since becoming the running back one in Miami. He just put up a buck twenty-nine total yards and a score on the Steelers. I like his value. He's the nineteenth-ranked running back in the one p.m. window, and I love the matchup in Detroit. Sorry, Detroit, but your defense stinks, and we are exploiting it on FanDuel, baby. Uh, let's move on. Where are we moving on? Raheem Mostert. 6,800, he's been on a tear since becoming the RB1 in Miami. Oh, we're not doing Raheem Mostert? I'm really confused, did I just miss that? Am I drunk? Half of, can we look at where the line is? Did it take me six sips without eating anything this morning to get to? <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, Greg Dulcich, that's what we're doing, guys. 4,900, uh, we were looking through this. Hamilton says he's the value of the week. And that's why he is on this list. He's a rookie tight end. He's got uh, the game in London against the Jags, of course. And he's priced at 25th at tight end. Hurt to start the season. He's been a tight end one in both games played so far this year. He's got six grabs for 51 yards as you take a look. And I do like Greg Dulcich's matchup against those Jags. Why? The Jags give up a ton and through the air. So we're looking at Tua, Raheem Mostert, and Derek Henry. And Greg Dulcich, that was wonky, but uh, let's keep talking here uh, about Russell Wilson. So Greg, of course, made that trip to London and so did Russell Wilson. And then he talked about it and he got a hell storm to deal with. Schefter is reporting that Broncos head coach Nathaniel Hackett said that Russell Wilson is going to start Sunday in London. He's dealing with a plethora of injuries and we know that. But, you know, apparently the quarterback has been pretty insistent that he wants to play. He's done all of the right things and he will go out there. I also think you know if you're Russell Wilson you want to be out there with the international audience it matters to you it's very cool I think it'd be a hard thing for him to say no to he did all the right stuff to try to recover and he's going to be out there and I'm not surprised by that at all by the way I told you last week uh, you cannot question Russell Wilson's toughness. He does not miss games. He does not like to miss games and it's very important to him as he reveals and wants to talk about now 
When it comes to the high knees of it all and the pooping, which is everyone's talking about, I still don't know, was the pooping a real story or not a real story? Conrad, fake news. Okay, so you not, when you get to the point where people are making fun and the onionifying your bowel movements, I think it borderlines on bullying and it's jumped the shark. That's true that everyone's piling on again. And I, as the <laughs> maternal <laughs> voice, in the room as always, as I'm not Petty Murphy ever, I wanna defend him. I wanna be like, why is everyone piling on? Shut up. But here's the thing that's so cool about Russell Wilson is that I wanna defend him, but it is so clear that he doesn't need it. He knows everyone makes fun of him. He knows that saying that he's hitting the high knees, he knows that's going to get dragged but he doesn't back down. He doesn't tone it down. He could say, man, people are roasting me. Maybe I shouldn't wear these stupid motorcycle gloves Kay Adams is making fun of. Maybe I should, but I need to pull back. I need a change. But no, the lesson of Russell Wilson is that he is him all of the time and he's different. We get it, he's on his own wavelength, but I admire the commitment that he has to his craft the dedication he has to bettering himself and everyone around it, even if it's vocal, I respect it because this is happening in a world where so many people, myself included, are too cool to admit that they care about a goddamn thing. So I hope he's feeling healthier. I hope he's ready to start making people eat their memes and their subway danger witches this weekend. I am rooting for Russell Wilson. Is it the coolest thing to come out and sort of a borderline brag or say like how great? No, but like I also hate it when players say the same stuff all the time. You get up to the podium, you get in front of a microphone and you, you know, you it's shutty town. You just say the same, you know, trite, hackneyed comments all of the time. So the fact that he's even able to say anything or he wants to talk about it, like whatever. And just because he's different, it's no other player would say that, great. Like, is he hurting anyone? Is he offending anyone? Not to my knowledge, unless I'm missing something. And I've heard all the stories and I know some of the inner workings and all of that, but the, uh, you know, the all in trashing with high knees. I wish I could do high knees. In fact, I want to get a doctor in here and school you all on the benefits of circulation when you're on the plane. You should get up and move up and down the aisles. He's winning, we're losing, and I think he wins this weekend. All right, we'll be back with some Ask K anything because clearly I've had some booze and clearly I'm interested in talking. Boozy Susie on a Friday. Um, last week, <laughs> I nailed it, baby. All running back edition, Aaron Jones, Josh Jacobs, Ramondre Stevenson. Uh, amazing. By the way, Aaron Jones had two, so I get bonus points. Let's run it back, baby. Here's what I got for week eight. Tyreek Hill. That's where we start. Ooh, we're going, we're going like a little spicy. Those were too easy, of course, last week. I got dragged for it on Twitter to high heavens for it. Fine. But Tyreek hasn't scored since week two, since that comeback over the Ravens, and that changes this week. The Lions play the most man cover of any team in the league, and I think that is a recipe for disaster against the speed of one said a cheetah. I like Tony Pollard up against the Chicago Bears, too. Um, he's finally, thank God, out snapping Zeke Elliott, right? The Bears have allowed seven touchdowns to running backs over the last six weeks. It just kind of makes sense. And then Kenneth Walker up against the Giants. Walker has scored three touchdowns so far in three starts. And it's the Giants' defense, and they've allowed 100-plus yards and a touchdown to Kenyon Drake and Travis Etienne over the last two. Mm -hmm. Pow, pow, pow. This is my punch-out. What's the kid's name in punch-out? Little Timmy? Little Timmy. This is my Lily Timmy. Little Mac. Little Mac special. Little Timmy. Little Timmy is from Christmas. It's from a Christmas Carol, I think. I've never even seen that movie. Hamilton, welcome to the show. Hey, what's up? I had no idea this was happening until like 10 seconds ago. So so, we, uh, 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 New Rochelle, big game, big game, baby. Oh, yeah, we got a playoff game versus Arlington today. I'm ready to go. Hopefully we can pull it off. It's great to see you here drunk on a, uh, on a Friday morning. <laughs> Friday Night Lights. I'll be in New York Monday. Uh, Want to host uh, the segment with some Ask K Anything? Uh, sure, sure. Let's, uh, let's pull up the first tweet we got. All right. This is uh, from one of our favorites, uh, Big Action Bill, who uh, is also Mike Frances impersonator. He says, are, are you worried? What? I'm I assuming that's in reference to, are you worried about being able to get Mike Francesa on the show oh. next week? Listen, I'm coming to New York to find Mike Francesa. 
I've been chasing him. He's like the guy, you know, he's doing that thing that, that I do to guys in dating where I'm like, nah, eh, eh. And then I just get chased more and more and more. So like, this is what, this is the game plan. I'm going there and I'm going there, you know, I'm just a girl in front of a Francesa begging him to come on my show. <laughs> I think we. I think you got a good shot. I think he's going to give in. That's what you have to do. He's the sports pope. Yeah. You have to kiss the ring a little bit. You got to. You got to play that game I'll with kiss him. The ring, I, all I right. think it's going to come through. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> that sounds well, awful. Keep going. It does. Let's go to our next tweet uh, before we dig too much into that. Uh, <laughs> My- <laughs> inter- interview Jamal every week. Oh Question man. Mark? Jamal Williams, listen, I want to make a, I don't know if it's a list, there needs to be an all pro, all beloved team that we should put together on Up and Adams like that. Even if in the worst rivalry, like Ravens, Ravens, Steelers, Bear, like there's still respect and universally beloved. He's definitely on that list. Love him. Oh, definitely. And we got one more for you. Uh, it's, are you losing more money on parlays <laughs> or parking tickets? Well, you got to vote right in California because I can't get anything done over here. So I'm definitely spending more prob- uh, more money on parking tickets. I'm at $93 and count. And of course, let me tell you this. I lost my parking ticket, so now I don't know what to do. Oh, and the man. second, well, I brought it to the show. Of course, it's gone. Then the second <laughs> thing is, I yesterday, I'm on the phone with our producer, Conrad Company. And I'm on the phone with him talking about the show, and I parked in the same on the same street I got the ticket on, and I walk out and I see a man aviator glasses. It looked like it was a Halloween costume. And I said, "Did you give me a ticket the other day?" And he said, "Yes." And I go, "Why?" And he goes, "You were literally on the bike lane, like you weren't even. It was you were on it." And I said, "Listen, I'll get." And I think I kind of asked if I could, you know, take him to lunch or something if he just doesn't give me oh tickets on this one street that I park on every day. And he's, you know, he wasn't having it. And then I'm going to like bring him. I'm pretty sure something. that's bribery and you're not allowed to do that. But sure. I thought I'm a crude negotiator. Hey, good luck to New Rochelle. I'll read about it in the papers. Austin Leslie, we see you.